so I think we can uh, we can start uh, quickly. Uh, maybe we can uh, start uh, by introducing uh, myself. My name is Mohamed Zatar, and uh, I work for BVI uh, Physiol in the Middle East North Africa region. Um, I would like to start to by thanking uh, everyone for joining this uh, webinar, which is very interesting for us, uh, and it's going to be uh, performed by uh, Dr. Ala Danasuri. Of course, many people they know Dr. Ala, so I will give just a quick, uh, quick briefing about the uh, history of Dr. Ala. So Dr. Ala is currently uh, serving as the Chief Medical Officer and Director of the Cornea and Refractive Surgery Unit at the Al Maghribi Hospitals and Centers. And he's currently a board member of the International Council of Ophthalmology and member of the Intraocular, International Intraocular uh, Implant Club and the American European Congress of Ophthalmic Surgery. Um, Dr. Ala also uh, served as the president of the ISRS during the years of 2010 and 2011, and he was elected to serve as a uh, member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology Board of Trustees till 2014, being the first non-American uh, to serve in this position. Um, in 1991, he was among the very first uh, refractive surgeons to perform examiner exam laser surgeries in the world and introduced many ophthalmic procedures to the Middle East, including fake YULs, uh, intraocular rings, uh, conductive keratoplasty, femtolasic, cross-linking, corneal inlays, femtocataract surgery, etc. And of course, everybody knows that he was the president of the uh, MIACO between 2004 and 2013. Uh, of course, Dr. Ala, with his uh, scientific approach, has so many awards uh, worldwide and book chapters for his uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications, including Lifetime Achievement Awards of the ISRS. Uh, and uh, being a, a, a one of the early people to start using multifocal IOL since its release back in, uh, let's say, 15 years, he has very good experience with multifocal IOLs and trifocal IOLs, uh, and he has implanted so many, so it will be great uh, to host Dr. Ala and to have his experience with his uh, presentation about uh, multifocality and quality of vision. Um, I leave the microphone for you now, Dr. Ala. I think I gave a good introduction for you, so you can you can take the lead now. Uh, at the end of the session, I will uh, I will uh, handle the questions and answers, uh, hopefully within 30, 40 minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I really appreciate your introduction, uh, but. It makes me feel a little bit older when you start talking about life achievements and, and long time <laughs> experience, then you start to feel old. <laughs> uh, also, I want to extend my thank to, to Physiol for um, arranging for this webinar. Um, it's really, uh, we're addressing today a, a very important topic, which is multifocality and the quality of vision. Uh, we're going to, uh, my presentation will be like 35 to 40 minutes to give uh, some time for discussion. Uh, this talk, I think it's very important topic for two reasons. The first is that we are uh, using more and more multifocal lenses in the last few years. Um, and it's becoming an important part of our practice. Uh, and we know that multifocality has to do with the uh, quality of vision. Uh, quality of vision is very important because every time we surgeons uh, try to uh, operate on a patient uh, visual system or optical system, uh, we are changing the quality of vision. So we're trying to improve the quality of vision uh, or at least to preserve the quality of vision. And in order to be able to do so, we have to know how we can accurately uh, and objectively measure the quality of vision before and after the surgery. Uh, also, we need to know how much multifocality affects the quality of vision so we can predict or anticipate uh, the quality of vision after surgery, so we can know which patient will be happy and what are the reasons 
for patients to be unhappy after multiple surgery. So uh, these are my financial disclosures and consulting for Physiol. Physiol was the first company to introduce the trifocal concept uh, many years back due to the combined work of, of uh, Dr. Gatinel, Damian Gatinel, uh, and uh, Mr. Parnui. And together they uh, started to uh, introduce the concept of trifocal lenses. Uh, and since then, many other companies, manufacturers, are doing trifocal lenses uh, because it proved to be very effective. Uh, so in the first part of my talk, we're going to um, uh, review how we can objectively measure or quantify quality of vision. Uh, it's usually very difficult to quantify quality. Uh, and I remember many years back when we started doing eczema laser surgery, uh, uh, we were talking about the quality of vision mainly subjectively. Uh, patient satisfaction, uh, sub uh, subjective questionnaires after surgery, but I was never convinced that the best way to assess the quality of vision is to go uh, with the subjective tools. Uh, today we have a very friendly and accurate uh, tools to objectively measure the quality of vision. So this is what we're going to go through in the first part of this presentation. And then in the next, in the second part, uh, I'm going to share with you our results with the trifocal lens and uh, keeping in mind that what we really want to know, to, to, to know today is how much compromise, how much trading off uh, of the quality of vision we should expect using the trifocal lens. And then at the end, we're going to summarize some pearls or some keys to success with the trifocal uh, uh, surgery. Now, uh, let's start with the uh, assessment of the quality of vision. We know that vision is a very complex sense and it involves uh, optical, uh, sensory and neural processing. So in order to measure the entire quality of vision of the entire system, visual system, we need to measure optical and uh, sensory neural uh, portions of this complex uh, sense. Uh, the optical portion or the ocular portion of the, vis of the uh, visual system involves, again, many uh, 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 components. Uh, the tear film, the cornea, and the lens being the most important. So let's start with the visual acuity. Visual acuity is the most commonly uh, used tool to assess uh, vision of the patients. Uh, we're doing this every day. But there are two things I want everyone to keep in mind when you measure the visual equity. Be aware that the uh, visual equity charts are not the same. And I remember when we started dealing with presbyopia correction some 20 years ago, we did a study comparing different uh, visual equity charts, especially for near vision, and we found a big difference. So, for example, the Rosenbaum cards on your right hand side are really not good. That, they're fine for screening, but you should not use this if you're doing any serious analysis of presbyopia correction. The E letters are better, but the best are the slow letters uh, as shown on your, on your left hand side. And we, we are using a, 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 some kind of sophisticated advanced uh, tool to, to measure the visual equity, which is the clinical trial suite I have no financial interest, but I have big uh, clinical interest in this uh, system because it minimizes the bias. You cannot eliminate bias, but it minimizes bias, of, especially the technician bias. It uses the Sloan letters, which are approved uh, for the visual um, equity measurement, as opposed to the E letters or the C uh, letters, the Randall uh, letters. And then it shows the, uh, um, the letter in a randomized fashion. So the patient cannot memorize uh, the, um, uh, the letters. It can measure far, intermediate, and near vision. And it generates uh, automated results. Uh, most important is the defocus curve. 
that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Now, when we measure the visual equity, we have to, especially if you're dealing with presbyopic patients and presbyopic correction, you want to measure the visual equity at variable distances. Of course, we cannot measure the vision at every single distance. So we measure the vision at far vision, which is four meters or more, uh, intermediate vision, and uh, at 60 or 80 centimeters, uh, this is the distance where you use your, 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 your uh, uh, computer screen or your uh, dashboard when you're driving. And the near vision at 40 centimeters, this is where you use your, um, uh, where you're reading or using your, uh, your smartphones. So these are the three uh, distances we are measuring the vision at. And then we can generate the defocus curve. For those who are not uh, familiar with the focus curve, uh, this is how we do it. First, we feed the patient with his distant correction, if he needs any distant correction, and then we start measuring his distant vision after uh, putting uh, in the trial frame or in the foropter um, uh, different lenses from plus one, 1.5 till minus four or minus 4.5. And then we measure the distance vision with this uh, added lens. This gives you a good idea on the range of accommodation or pseudo accommodation in, in uh, patients with multifocal lenses. Uh, it gives you a very good uh, 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 idea on how the patient sees at different distances. So for example, what you see on the screen now is a defocus curve of a young subject. He is not presbyopic, like 30 years old. Uh, he has no cataract, he has perfect vision, perfect op optical system, perfect quality of vision. So his defocus curve will be as like this. He can see uh, uh, more than 2020. This line uh, shows the 2020. So he can see better than 2020 at all distances, uh, far, intermediate, and near. A presbyopic patient or a patient with monofocal lens. Uh, will have uh, this kind of defocus curve. Very good vision for the far, and then the vision starts to deteriorate uh, rapidly, and he has a poor intermediate and poor near vision. Uh, what we're trying to do, if you are treating presbyopia, we're trying to uh, close this gap in the intermediate and near vision. Now, visual equity does not tell you the whole story. Uh, it tells you how the visions, how the patient sees at high contrast level. We use uh, black uh, letters, black optotypes on white background. So this is a high contrast level. So you need to measure the visual, the, 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 if you want to measure the quality of vision, you have to uh, measure the contrast sensitivity function, which is the most uh, accurate and most sensitive way to measure the quality of vision. We're using, again, the uh, the CTS, the clinical trial suite, to measure the contrast sensitivity uh, at different contrast levels, at different uh, uh, spatial frequencies, in, in variable light condition. So we, we do it at in photopic, uh, mesopic, and scotopic, and at different level uh, levels of glare. So we do the contrast sensitivity, we measure it at low glare, medium glare, and, and uh, high glare. And this is how the screen looks when you are measuring the contrast sensitivity with glare, and this is pretty much uh, mimics the way the patient see in real life when he's driving his car at night. Uh, uh, this is uh, how he can see. And then uh, you generate the uh, contrast sensitivity uh, function curves. Of course, the, scoto the, the photopic uh, contrast sensitivity will be the highest, and then the mesopic, and then the mesopic with glare. The most important measure of contrast sensitivity is the mesopic contrast sensitivity and the mesopic with glare. Uh, now, measuring the contrast sensitivity for every single patient before surgery and after surgery is cumbersome and it takes time and it, it's not easy. If you want to do the full test, it takes like 40 minutes, which is not really uh, uh, if you do the, 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 the focus curve and the contrast sensitivity, it takes a good 20, uh, 45 minutes or so. So fortunately, we have other tools uh, that can generate a very good impression uh, and objective measurement of 
the quality of vision. Like, but but the, 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 the defect here or the bad thing here is that it measures only the optical part. So from now on, let's assume that our patient has a good a sensory neural portion of his visual system. So the patient does not have optic atrophy, does not have age related macular degeneration, the patient does not have any visual pathway uh, uh, issues. So now we're, we're objectively measuring the uh, optical portion of the visual system. So the easiest way and the most commonly used way is to look at the aberrometers, uh, look at the aberrometry maps. Uh, this map on your left hand side shows the wavefront uh, of a normal uh, patient. Uh, the high order aberrations are shown here. Now we are uh, measuring, we can measure the total aberrations that include the high order and the low orders, but you know the low orders can easily be corrected with the sphere and cylinder. So what's important for us is the high order aberrations to assess the quality of vision of this patient. So if this cornea has a high order aberration, if this eye has a high order aberrations of 0 0.15, then this is within the normal range. So we can uh, 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 anticipate a very good quality of vision of this patient. Now on your right hand side is a very important graph, which is the modulation transfer function graph, which is uh, similar to the contrast sensitivity, but without the sensory neural part of it. But you can generate this in a few seconds. So what does this graph tells us? It tells me that this patient has a perfect quality of vision that is shown in on the pink graph. Uh, this is the high order MTF. The blue curve shows the low order MTF. So if this patient is not wearing his correction, this is the amount of vision and the quality of vision he is seeing shown in, in, in blue. But if you correct only the low order aberrations, the sphere and cylinder, then this patient have a, a, a better and an almost normal, actually it is normal, an excellent quality of vision shown in the, um, on the pink, on the pink uh, uh, graph. Uh, now, uh, Ocular aberrometry still, this map shows an eye with a high myopia. He, this patient is minus 16. So you can see how poor the quality of vision is, but we don't care about the sphere and cylinder because we can easily correct this. You want to know how much high order aberration, aberration this eye has, which is shown him, here uh, below. This patient, this eye has a very low corneal uh, high order aberrations and on your MTF graph the blue curve is very low but if you get rid of the sphere and cylinder then this patient will have an excellent quality of vision. So when I have a patient with such a barometry map I know that the patient is today enjoying a very good quality of vision before the surgery. So before embarking on any kind of surgery I need to, in to make sure that whatever I'm going to do is not going to uh, compromise or decrease his uh, quality of vision. Now, uh, uh, a patient with a high order aberration, like in this case, total high order aberrations of 2.3, that's a terrible vision, that's a very bad vision, then you have to know, you know that this patient is starting with a very poor quality of vision and it's not due to the sphere and cylinder only, because the, the two graphs are very close, but this patient has a poor quality of vision before the surgery. So if you're going to operate on this patient, you have to be able to improve his quality of vision. Otherwise, the patient will not be happy after surgery. Now, uh, the ocular aberrations are, can lie in the cornea or inside the eye. Inside the eye, mainly the lens. So it's important to assess uh, where do the corneal aberrations lie. It's important to, to know whether the uh, corneal, the high order aberrations come are originating from the cornea or from the lens. That's why it's of equal importance to measure the corneal aberrations alone without the rest of the eye. In this case, uh, the corneal aberrations are as low as 0.2, that's perfect. 
the patient has an excellent MTF curve. But in this eye, the corneal aberrations are very high. So you know that if you do not uh, uh, treat the corneal pathology of these patients, you will have a poor quality of vision after surgery. So this is very important to evaluate before you embark on any kind of ocular surgery. Where do the, the high order aberrations lie? Is it in the cornea or in the lens? Another example, this is again the MTF curve, but here it's measured with the, uh, uh, the eye tracing. Uh, then you can see the total MTF, the total eye quality of vision is very bad, but the corneal MTF is very high. Then this patient will definitely uh, uh, be happy if you do a lens-based surgery. Because, but if you do a corneal based surgery, this patient will be very unhappy. So why? Because his corneal uh, quality of vision is very good. Uh, uh, if you deal with the internal problem that he has, this patient will have a good quality of vision after surgery. Uh, on the other side, if you have a patient with low total MTF and the corneal MTF is very low, then you know that you cannot make this patient happy unless you fix his corneal problem. So you know that the patient is starting with a poor quality of vision because of he, he has a bad cornea. So dealing with the lens only is not enough. So the ocular high order aberrations uh, tells you the overall performance of the eye. The ocular high order aberrations tell you the overall performance of the eye, while the corneal high order aberrations tell you how good uh, the quality of vision can be uh, after uh, cataract surgery or after uh, lens uh, exchange. So uh, if this is the whole thing, aberrometry is enough to uh, uh, select your patients for uh, uh, multifocal uh, uh, choice. Of course not, but are as, uh, as important is the evaluation of the tear film stability. You can do this on the slit lamp. Uh, we are all doing this. You can use the, some staining. You can check the marginal strip, marginal tear strip. You can do the um, uh, breakup time on the slit lamp and see uh, the time uh, when the, uh, the tear film first break. But now we have uh, an accurate tool to measure the uh, uh, stability of the tear film. Uh, here I'm using the HD analyzer. I have no financial interest, but it's a very good tool to measure the stability of the tear film. For example, in this eye, you have a pretty stable tear film. I have no problem uh, uh, operating on this eye and I can expect very good results. Uh, if the patient has a moderate uh, tear film stability, then it's always better to uh, uh, use some lubricants before and after the surgery and to tell your patient that he needs some lubrication after the surgery. But if you have such a bad breakup time and the tear film is totally unstable, this can be a contraindication to you to do any kind of multifocal uh, surgery uh, on the patient or any kind of ocular surgery unless you're going to fix the problem of the uh, tear film. Uh, because this affects dramatically the quality of vision. Now, there is an important thing that is usually overlooked, which is the scatter. Uh, the scatter or the stray light um, is a kind of aberration that is not measured by aberrometers because aberrometers are not designed to measure scatter. Uh, and the, the main source of uh, uh, decreased quality of vision after any multifocal surgery, whether the multifocality on the cornea or in the lens, is the scatter. So it's important to be able to assess the scatter before and after surgery. Now, how can we do this? The only, the only way to measure the, uh, to objectively measure uh, the uh, scatter in a clinical setup is the HD analyzer. And we've been using this for many years and it, it definitely it improved our results with, with multifocal lenses. So for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with the uh, HD analyzer, uh, look at this number. This is the OSI, which is the Objective Scatter Index. I have no financial interest with this, uh, uh, with the HD analyzer. Uh, uh, the o Objective Scatter Index 
is a number that is given by the uh, device and it tells you how good or bad the overall quality of vision is uh, and how much scatter is um, ha happening in this eye. The lower the number, the better the visual acuity. A perfect eye will give you between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6. And then when, it, when it's in the yellow range, it's acceptable. When it's red, it's bad. So this is an example of an excellent uh, uh, optical system with an OSI of 0 0.3. A patient with cataract, like in this case, will have a very bad objective cataract index up to 5.4 and sometimes more. This is actually uh, uh, grade 2 or grade 3 uh, cataract. Now, the last thing that you need to assess in order to be able to know uh, uh, the quality of vision of your patient, especially after multifocal lenses, is the optical, the alignment of the optical system of your patient. And this can be measured easily if you uh, uh, measure the angle kappa and the angle alpha. The angle kappa is the angle between the visual axis and the pupillary axis, this one, and the angle alpha is usually bigger and in, in, uh, it's measured between the visual axis to the optical axis. Now, clinically, how can we uh, uh, measure this? Very simple, most of the uh, topographers or the aberrometers uh, uh, can give you this number. For example, on this map, you can see the angle alpha here is 0 0.3, that's pretty small, but the angle kappa is 0 0.7, so this is relatively high. Uh, in other patients, you can have the opposite, a, a larger angle kappa, a larger angle alpha, and smaller angle kappa. So what is the importance here? If you're trying to center a multifocal lens, the best place to center a lens, an IOL, in the patient's eye, you want the lens to be centered on the visual axis and also in this, on the center of the pupil uh, uh, if, if, if the lens is multifocal. But you cannot do this because the center of the pupil is usually uh, not the same as the center of the visual axis. Uh, so a compromise, would, a, a good compromise would be somewhere between the visual axis and the center of the pupil. But the bad news is you cannot uh, center the lens where you want. You, you put the lens in the bag, you might be able to move it during surgery and to nudge it a little bit nasally, but the lens will go after a few hours to uh, where it should be, which is centers itself on the uh, bag, in the bag. So usually the lens uh, is centered on the optical axis of the eye. So that's why it's important to measure the angle uh, alpha, not only the angle kappa. Well, this is a big debate, and which is more important, but whichever you use will be helpful. If you use angle kappa or angle alpha or both of them, this will help you to know uh, the, the, or to expect the quality of vision after your surgery based on the lens uh, centration. So now, so far, what did we learn? We went through the visual acuity that has to be measured with the proper tool at far, near, and intermediate distance. Contrast sensitivity is the best way to measure the visual function of the patient's uh, visual system, but it's a little bit cumbersome and takes too much time. So we can uh, 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 use the objective measurements, including the ocular aberrations, the corneal aberrations, ear film stability, and the scatter, which is very important. And also, we need to measure the optical system alignment uh, as measured with the angle kappa and the angle alpha. Now, this is an example of a patient who has low uh, uh, high order aberrations. Ocular high order aberrations are excellent, 0 0.2. The MTF, the high order MTF is excellent. Uh, the corneal high order aberrations are very good. The MTF, the high order MTF uh, for the cornea is excellent. And the angle kappa and alpha are within range. So this patient is an excellent candidate for uh, multifocal surgery. Uh, this is another eye that has a terrible uh, uh, high order aberrations, a terrible ocular high order aberrations, uh, bad uh, MTF. But if you look at the corneal aberrations that are low, that are within normal range, and the corneal MTF is close to being excellent. So this patient is a very good candidate for uh, uh, multifocal lenses, especially his angle alpha and kappa are uh, within the range. 
less than 0.6 millimeters. So I would be very happy to do a, a, a whatever kind of uh, surgery using a multifocal lens on this patient, whether it's cataract surgery or clear lens extraction or reflective lens exchange uh, uh, for this patient if he needs it. Uh, an important question is post-refractive surgery. We always have uh, this question, how far we can go? Well, as long as the corneal aberrations are not high, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, up to 0 0.4 microns of corneal aberrations with a good MTF or contrast sensitivity will give you always a satisfied patient. Now, let's move to the uh, uh, more interesting part, which is the outcomes the, that we can expect, that we are having and we can expect after multifocal lens. Now, multifocality is by definition an optical compromise. The best surgeon on earth uh, cannot uh, do anything about the laws of physics. So the laws of physics taught us that multifocality is an optical compromise. And when we talk about compromise, there is something that the patient would give, which is a little bit of quality of vision, but he will take against this uh, uh, correction of the refractive error if he has high error, correction of the astigmatism, correction of the presbyopia and removing of his cataract. So you have to weigh the uh, risk-benefit ratio for this patient. That's why it's very important to know how much trading off is a multifocal landscape. Uh, remember that multifocality is not a restoration of the accommodation, but it's a compensation. And here, the big subject, the difference between simultaneous vision and alternate vision uh, 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 that the multifocal lenses can give. The multifocal lenses gives you a simultaneous vision. The patient can see far, near, intermediate at the same time. And it's the brain that chooses which, which uh, uh, picture to get into focus. So that's, there is a learning curve here. Uh, when we talk about trifocals, uh, I don't like to call them multifocals because historically, uh, bifocal lenses were called multifocal when they were the only available multifocal lenses. So I would always like to call them trifocal because there is a big difference between trifocal and bifocal, though the, both are multifocal lenses. My personal experience with bifocal lenses was not successful. I did many of these lenses many years back, then I totally stopped using them uh, because they gave us issues. The main issues were a very bad intermediate vision so the patient is complaining all the time, plus some photic phenomena because of the multifocality. And this always ended in having long chair time, patients are complaining too much, you have to explain to them before the surgery and after surgery, and whatever you do, you have a relatively high rate of unhappy patients. That, that's why for many, many years, uh, I did not use the bifocal lenses and I was using monofocal or monovision uh, with monofocal lenses for my uh, cataract patients. But once the trifocal became available to me like four uh, years ago, uh, my experience totally changed. And that's mainly because the trifocal lenses gives you a very good intermediate vision and you will not uh, appreciate the importance of intermediate vision till you hit your, your 50s. Uh, uh, you, you, of course, you, you will not appreciate the importance of near vision till you hit the presbyopia age 45 or so, but the intermediate vision is as important and maybe more important than the uh, near vision. Uh, that's why when I started uh, uh, using the trifocal lenses, I wanted to know how much compromise I'm giving my patients. That's why we uh, designed this uh, study many years back uh, uh, when we started with the trifocals, uh, that was a very uh, well-designed formal uh, study. We had 36 patients uh, operated bilaterally, and we included only patients who have very good uh, potential of quality of vision. So we had patients with early cataract or with high uh, refractive errors that cannot be corrected with, with phacic lenses, for example, or, or, or laser vision correction. Uh, uh, patients, all the patients had excellent stable uh, uh, tear film 
We measured the high order aberrations of the cornea and the total eye before the surgery. So we know what quality of vision are the patients having before the surgery. Uh, all our patients had an angle kappa less than 0 0.6 and all the patients had no ocular comorbidity. So we excluded any patient uh, who can have a, uh, any disease that might affect the quality of vision after surgery. Uh, all the patients had stable tear film, uh, corneal errors less than 0.4, uh, um, corneal high order MTF 50% or more, uh, angle kappa less than 6 millimeter. And uh, we used toric lenses for any eye who had a corneal astigmatism of one diopter or more. Uh, and we used spherical lenses for uh, any eye who had less than 0 0.5 diopter. For those patients who are between 0 0.6 and 1, and these are not few patients, are 20% of our patients. If the astigmatism is with the rule, we use a spherical lens. If the astigmatism is against the rule, then we use a toric lens because we don't want to leave the patient with against the rule astigmatism after the surgery. We use the Barrett calculator for the spherical and uh, toric lenses. This is, of course, a long, a long, a, a long topic on its own. But the only thing I'm going to uh, 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 draw your attention at, when you use the, any kind of calculations or calculator for IOL, use it to its maximum. For example, with the Barrett calculator, you need to enter the lens thickness and the white to white, even if it's optional, because this has to do with the calculation of the, of the IOL, because it takes in consideration the posterior uh, corneal astigmatism. If you don't, uh, you put these numbers, then it's fine. It will give you a calculation, but it's not the best. So always use the calculator to its best. Uh, with the toric lenses, uh, as I mentioned, anyone who had one diopter or more of astigmatism had a toric lens. Uh, we use the uh, pod F and pod FT, which is a trifocal aspheric diffractive lens. I like the design, the platform of this lens because the double C loop has two advantages actually. The, the, the most important advantage is the stability. This lens has four points of fixation. Uh, uh, so it's stable, wherever you put it in the bag, uh, it does not rotate. The, the torsional stability of this lens is very high as opposed to the C-loop uh, uh, platforms. It, had, uh, it has a toric design, it's apodized, so uh, in, in when the pupil gets large in dim illumination, more energy goes to the far vision. When the pupil gets small during the uh, uh, reading uh, reflex at near vision, the more energy goes to the near uh, focus. Uh, we use the hydrophilic lens, which I believe has the best quality of vision. Hydrophobic is also available, uh, but not yet in, uh, in, in some countries. But what we use for this study was the hydrophilic lens. Now, these are the uh, uh, refractive outcome six months after the surgery. And you can see here, 90% of our patients are within half a diopter. And almost everyone within one diopter, we had only one patient who uh, ended in minus 1.25. And this patient had a laser vision correction, LASIK over the uh, 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 pseudophakia uh, six months after the surgery. So the refractive outcome is predictable, is very good using uh, uh, the tools that we used in this study. We also measured the vector analysis. Uh, again, in any serious uh, analysis of astigmatism, you want to do the vector analysis. And this is the way where you can measure your own surgical induced astigmatism to use it to improve your IOL calculation. So the, the vector analysis of astigmatism shows six months after the surgery, that the curve is pretty compact. You see before the surgery, it's scattered all over the place. But after the surgery, uh, except for, for this outlier who has 1.5 uh, astigmatism, but everyone had astigmatism less than uh, one down. We measured the uncorrected uh, visual equity, uh, the far vision at six months. 90% could see 20, 20 uh, or better. And 91% could see 20, 30 or better. Uh, at intermediate distance. This is something that we never saw 
with the monofocal lenses. And this is the main reason why the patients really love the results after the trifocal lenses, because they give them a very good intermediate vision. The near vision was even better. 94% uh, uh, could see 2030 uh, uh, or better at 40 centimeters. And remember that these patients uh, uh, are measured with uh, their distant correction. So if the patient end in like minus 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, we, we fit the patient with the, the uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 lens. Uh, so we are measuring the, uh, the eye with the distant corrected vision. So this is not uh, 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 myopic shift. This is the uh, uh, near vision with the distant corrected vision. And that's very important if you're going to evaluate the effect of multifocal. Now this is the focus curve I showed you at the beginning. The blue one is for a um, young subject, non-presbyopic, perfect. The green curve is the one for a monofocal lens. The gray one is the bifocal lens. It gives you good vision at far distance and near distance. But in between, there is a big trough and this is what makes the patient very unhappy. Now, in red is shown the defocus curve after the trifocal lens, after the pod F and pod FT. And you can see that the gap here at the intermediate vision is pretty much closed. So the patients are enjoying good vision at all distances, at least better than 2025 at all distances. Uh, and this is the reason why these patients are, are very happy. There is slightly slight depression here, so the near vision in this lens is better than the intermediate vision, but the intermediate vision is much better than what the patient can see with monofocal or bifocal lenses, and uh, it's 25 or 2025 or better, which is for, for real life, this is a, an excellent thing. The uh, contrast sensitivity of the entire optical system, we measured it with the, uh, at the mesopic uh, and mesopic with glare. Uh, the dashed line shows you the normal contrast sensitivity. The red line shows the mesopic contrast sensitivity after trifocal lenses. It's less than the normal, but uh, it's very acceptable. And this is the amount of compromise that you're giving your patient. If you measure it with the glare, then it's more uh, lower curve. And this here you can uh, objectively see the amount of compromise that the patients can have with uh, trifocal lenses. And this is not big to make the patient unsatisfied. We measured the high order MTF before and after the surgery, and you can see over time it's stable. So the patient have a very good quality of vision after surgery. Uh, example of a patient, uh, uh, this is his MTF before surgery. You can see on your left hand side, uh, a poor MTF, the ocular MTF, the entire eye has a poor quality of vision. The cornea per se has a very good quality of vision. So the problem comes from the internal MTF, the internal, which means the lens in this case. After the surgery, uh, the corneal MTF did not change because we did not change anything in the cornea. Uh, the internal MTF improved dramatically because we exchange the lens of this patient, this functional lens with a trifocal lens, and you can see the overall, the ocular uh, MTF is much improved as compared to the preoperative uh, uh, ocular uh, MTF. Now, what about the scatter? Here we have to differentiate between patients with cataract and patients with clear lens extraction. The, uh, the, the cataract uh, age group is higher, usually start with a high uh, scatter, then after the surgery that dramatically improved and at six months the mean uh, objective scatter index was 2.7, which for them is a great improvement of the quality of vision. On the other side, the patients with refractive lens exchange started with a perfect quality of vision and ended with a 1.7, so there is a little bit of deterioration of increased scatter, if you will, but the, now we can, I think for the first time, we can uh, uh, measure objectively the amount of compromise between 1 and 1.7 is not a big difference for the quality of vision. So these patients, if you're going to correct their presbyopia 
and their refractive error and their astigmatism and the cataract, if they have an early cataract, this patient would be extremely happy after the surgery. Let's take some clinical example. A patient with an early cataract, this is like plus two nuclear sclerosis. Objective scatter index is 5.4. Then after the surgery, six months after pot f the patients end with a, an OSI uh, of, uh, I cannot see it behind my picture, so this, that's an OSI is much improved. On the other side, uh, a patient who has a clear lens, but has a presbyopia and astigmatism. You see, this patient started with the, with the four diopters of cylinder. We did a lens exchange on him, and he ended in with the same scatter index. He started with 2.7, ended in 2.6, so the same quality of vision, but he got rid of his astigmatism, he got rid of his presbyopia, so he can uh, uh, be uh, spectacle independent. So this patient is very happy after the surgery. Another example, a young patient, uh, here is a, presbyo a hyperopic patient, non-presbyopic patient, uh, with a plus seven of uh, 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 error to start with, with a good, quite excellent quality of vision. So he ended in with an excellent quality of vision, but he got rid of his high hypermetropia and he can uh, see far intermediate and near vision. So this patient uh, is very happy after surgery with a, a potential visual equity of 2015. Uh, now, this is an example of a patient uh, that you need to take in, in consideration uh, uh, because he's hyperope, he's plus two before the surgery and presbyope, but he has no cataract and he has excellent quality of vision to start with. His OSI is 0.3 only. So this patient has a, a, an excellent quality of vision. So you might be, you have to make sure that this patient will not lose much. So the, the after surgery, the OSI is 1.2 in the green area. So this is an excellent quality of vision. So this patient gave some quality of vision, but he got a lot of benefits. He improved his uh, uh, refractive error, uh, not hyperope anymore. He's not using glasses for far and he improved his presbyopia. He's not using glasses for near. He got rid of his presbyopia. So he's spectacle independent. So this is the kind of patients when you have to uh, spend some time before the surgery in order to assess the quality of vision and to explain to him what would he uh, expect. Uh, we also did a subjective questionnaire in our study, though I do not believe much in subjective questionnaires, but all our patients were very satisfied, at least satisfied after the um, uh, surgery. Uh, when we asked them, 87% uh, described some non-disturbing photog phenomena. Only 12% of the patients self-reported uh, uh, some photog phenomena. 98% uh, of the patients had uh, total spectacle independency, except one patient who had minus 1.25, and this patient had LASIK six months after the surgery, and he got rid of his uh, uh, error. And when we asked the patients, everyone said clearly, that we would have the same lens again. And when we ask them about the photic phenomena, the glare, the halos at night, the typical answer is, well, we see them uh, in scotopic or, or mesopic conditions when we're driving at night, but it's not uh, uh, disturbing. And if this is the price we have to pay in order to be able to see far intermediate and near without glasses, it's welcome. And actually, uh, uh, we did not have any major complaints about it. So what did we learn from our study? We learned that the trifocal lenses gave us excellent results for far vision, intermediate vision, and near vision. Uh, the toric model uh, is very effective in compensating for the corneal astigmatism, if any. The impact on quality of vision, and this is the main outcome of our study, is uh, we could quantify it it's very acceptable for the patients and we can predict the quality of vision after surgery. Always remember that the trifocality is not a, a, a restoration of accommodation, but it's a compensation of the uh, accommodation because you're giving the patient simultaneous viewing uh, 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 all the time. So the patients have to understand this and 
they usually and most of our most of in most of the cases the patient can understand it takes them very few uh, uh, weeks or sometimes days to accommodate with this uh, now finally i'd like to acknowledge the team that did with me this study a lot of work a lot of measurements we did this at the Mahrabi hospital in, in Jeddah. it took us really long uh, long time and very much effort but we are happy that we reached this outcome and now we can very strongly advise our patients and recommend uh, trifocal lenses for most of our uh, uh, cataract patients and most of our uh, refractive lens exchange patients. Now the rate of, of trifocal lenses I'm using in my patients is more than 85%. And I thank you for your kind attention. So I leave the stage for you, Muhammad. Thank you very much, Dr. Ala. A pretty impressive presentation uh, as usual and as expected. Uh, I have some questions on the panel, so I would like to, uh, to read them for you one by one. So uh, I have a question from Professor Ruby. Uh, how far should we go with multifocal lens with the growing number of patients having done LASIK femto smile? Well, yes, that, that's a very valid question and very important question. And the answer is, if the patient had smile or any kind of uh, keratoreflective surgery, LASIK or PRK or anything else, even those patients who had RK a long time ago, if the patient uh, uh, has a very good quality of vision uh, at the level of the cornea, which means the corneal aberrations are not high, and by not high, I mean 0.4 microns of RMS or lower, then we can go with uh, multi with trifocal lenses and the goal is emetropia here we uh, it's not better to have uh, a low myopic shift actually with with trifocal lenses if i got you know the lens come comes in in half diopter step so if i have to choose between uh, plus uh, 0.2 uh, and minus 0.2 i'll go for plus 0.2 not for minus 0 0.2 because emetropia because some myopia and uh, uh, or astigmatism astigmatism being worse if you have uh, any residual myopia or or astigmatism the patients are, are, are unhappy so i will target emetropia on, on every patient even the patients who had uh, refractive corneal surgery so I suppose this uh, answers the question, uh, the next question, should we leave the patient emetropic or better low myopic after refractive corneal surgeries for his future multifocal lens? Uh, uh, no, I did not get the question. After multi, if we have a patient who had refractive surgery, uh, yes. then we, we target emetropia. If we have a patient who did not have refractive surgery, we also target emetropia. So in every case, our target, our refractive target is emetropia. And uh, uh, astigmatism is very important also, not only a spherical equivalent. If we have, I am using more uh, uh, toric lenses than spherical lenses uh, because uh, le leaving the patient with 0.75 or more of cylinder uh, will affect the quality of vision. Uh, another question, did you implant fine vision in patients having already a monofocal lens in one eye and what was the outcomes with the one eye with fine vision? Well, no, I did not do this uh, except in one case. It, it, it's a long story, but my patient ended in with one monofocal lens in one eye and a trifocal lens on the other eye. Uh, I would not recommend this at all because this patient uh, was not happy. He was happier with the monofocal uh, lens for far vision, but he was much happier with the multi with the trifocal lens on the other eye. So when you tell him, okay, I can easily exchange uh, any of them, he didn't want. He wants both lenses, but he was not happy. So I would not recommend. Uh, using monofocal lens in one eye. If a patient had uh, already a monofocal lens in one eye, I would go for a monofocal lens with monovision on the other eye. If the patient had a trifocal lens in the first eye, I would definitely do a trifocal on the other. But I would say patients with bilateral trifocal lenses, 
are happier than patients with bilateral monofocal lenses. Okay. Um, what are your results with post LASIK patients in terms of quality of vision after, after implanting fine vision? Well, this is this is very tricky. If we if we uh, I've done a lot of patients with uh, post uh, post LASIK or post smile or PRK. Uh, here, there are many things that you need to take in consideration. First is the quality of vision before the surgery, because as you know, keratorefractive surgery uh, has an effect on the quality of vision. So, if you're starting with a poor quality of vision, then the trifocal are not advisable. So first thing is to make sure that the patient has good quality of this uh, at the level of the cornea at least. Uh, the second thing is the IOL calculation. Then you have to be very accurate, you know, uh, with the, uh, the um, post-keratorefractive patients, you have a lot of IOL surprises on that if you're not taking care. So you have to use your best formula. There are many ways to measure uh, the IOL after refractive surgery. And nowadays, with the modern calculation formulas, you, you, you can get very good results. So I have no problem doing uh, uh, trifocal lenses on patients who previously had uh, refractive surgery. Uh, uh, if their quality of vision at the level of the cornea, which is the corneal MPF, the corneal point spread function, or the corneal high order aberrations, uh, are uh, in the acceptable range. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Naila. Uh, thank you a lot, Dr. Ala. Very informative lecture. Did you need to take the patient again to rotate the toric trifocal lens post-op? When can you do it? Yes, that's a very uh, important. Uh, that's a very important uh, subject. Uh, IOLs when you put toric lens. Uh, the lens might rotate in the first few hours. Uh, but with the double C loop, because it has four points of fixation, as well as the plate haptics, uh, rarely the lens rotate after surgery. So if you find a lens that is not in the accurate alignment after surgery, it's one of two causes. Either the lens rotated, which is very rare with the uh, double C loop or the four point fixation. Uh, or you put the lens, the surgeon, which is me in this case, put the lens kind of misaligned. There are a lot of reasons to, to have this kind of complication because, uh, um, you know, there is cyclotorsion, that is, that people might get small. There are a lot of reasons why the uh, surgeon might put uh, the, um, the toric lens in less than uh, optimal position. So if you find this on the first day, and it's easy to find it because uh, 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 you can see it on the street lamp, you, or you can do uh, 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 the ocular aberrations, I might be able to show you a picture here on my screen uh, that tells you exactly how you can uh, assess the post-operative alignment. Now, if the post-operative alignment, uh, if misalignment is more than 10 degrees, I would go immediately and fix the patient and fix, uh, rotate the lens. And again, uh, this is another advantage of the double C loop. Uh, you can rotate the lens on either uh, direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, as opposed to a, uh, the, C, the C loop, where you have to rotate the lens sometimes 360 degrees in order to correct only 10 degrees of, of, of astigmatism. So uh, when do I do it? The sooner the better. Within the first couple of months, it will be very easy to uh, rotate the lens back to the right position. Uh, later, it might be a little bit more difficult, but I would advise to do this very uh, as soon as possible. And the, the, reason, the way to, um, to, um, uh, to diagnose this, uh, I'm not sure if I have a slide here, but I can definitely find one for you. If you uh, want to um, uh, assess your um, alignment, you can do this with retro illumination. You can do this with any aberrometer, uh, and also the refraction. If you do a refraction, then you will have a mixed astigmatism if the lens is not in the right position. Okay, thank you. <coughs>
have another question. Uh, which types of material do you use of fine vision and why? I'm not sure I really understand this question. Well, I think I understand. I think he is referring or she's referring to the uh, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, all my experience with the pod F and pod FT was with the uh, hydrophilic that was introduced first. Uh, now the hydrophilic became available not yet available to me in, in here, um, in some countries in the Middle East, it's not yet available. Um, what the results with the, hydrophil with the hydrophilic are excellent. The quality of vision is very good. I'm not very excited to use the hydrophobic, but whenever it's available, I'm going to use it. Uh, I still expect very good quality of vision. The problem with the hydrophobic is the glistening. But I know that with the material, with, with the material used with the physiol, it, it, the material is glistening too, because we had a lot of issues with the glistening hydrophobic uh, acrylic uh, in the last few years. Uh, but I know that the hydrophobic uh, uh, physiol lens is glistening free. Um, the, the bad thing or the bad reputation about hydrophilic is that it uh, induces more PCOs which is, I don't think this is accurate. Uh, my rate of uh, PCOs is with the hydrophilic is not higher than the hydrophobic. Uh, it has to do more with the square, with the edge of the, um, of the lens rather than the material. Uh, and remember that many of the patients who are using premium lenses will need yak capsulotomy even for a little bit of PCOs whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic, because these patients are seeking the best quality of vision. So with the earliest sign of PCOs, you might need to do a YAG on these patients. And we've done a, a, a few YAGs after uh, pod F and pod FT with, with excellent results. Uh, the hydrophobic, I use the hydrophobic physiol with the, uh, with the Triumph lens, uh, uh, which is the newest, uh, uh, edition of the physiol lenses. Um, uh, I did not have any issues with glistening with the hydrophobic Triumph lens. It has the advantage of correcting the, some of the chromatic aberrations, the longitudinal chromatic aberrations, which give good, very good quality of vision. Uh, in the few Triumph cases I did, the intermediate vision is excellent. Uh, the near vision is very good. What I had with the, um, with the long experience with the pod F and pod FT, excellent near vision and very good intermediate vision. So, uh, so I think uh, in the, in the, in the uh, future, it has to do with the patient's um, needs. If the patient is more of a near vision, then the pod F and pod FT will be better. If the patient is more for an intermediate vision, then the, um, the triumph would be uh, victorious. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, how can we manage the severe dry eye patient and is it fit for trifocal? Well, the first part of the question is very difficult to answer. The second part is easy. Uh, are they good candidates for trifocals? No, they are not good candidates for any kind of multifocal surgery. Uh, and you have to treat the uh, severe dry eye first. How to treat it? This is another another uh, webinar. But uh, but what I do uh, frequently is to use, of course, lubricants, uh, more the gel-based uh, uh, lubricants. Uh, punctal occlusion is uh, very helpful. I think punctal occlusion is very much overseen by uh, refractive surgeons. Uh, I, 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 uh, I do punctal occlusion for many patients and they benefit from punctal occlusion. Uh, I would not go to multifocal uh, lens unless the tear film stability is improved. Okay. Uh, how do you measure post-op glare and halos? Uh, well, glare and halos after uh, uh, surgery in general can be due to spherical aberrations or coma or scatter. So uh, you measure the ocular spherical aberration, so you can tell how much 
uh, uh, spherical aberration or coma the patient has, and you measure the objective scatter index, this will tell you how much scatter the patient has. And remember that the multifocal lenses, uh, 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 they induce, the main aberration that are inducing is scatter. Uh, so that's why measuring the scatter is becoming uh, very important in my practice. Okay. Um, what is your advice when a miscalculated trifocal lens has been inserted and outcome is unsatisfactory? Uh, first of all, I would want to know why was it miscalculated? Uh, because this is how we learn how to improve our calculation uh, formula. Uh, second is, depends on whether the, 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 the miscalculation is in the, uh, whether the patient is in early or late post-operative. So on the first day, if the patient, if I realize that a patient has a, a wrong calculation uh, and the lens is already inserted in the eye, I would, if the difference is big, I would exchange it. Uh, in the first month or two months, uh, exchanging a, a, um, a pod F or pod FT lens is a piece of cake. So if the, if the error is like three or four or more, or even two diopters, I would go and exchange the lens if it's in the early post-operative period. Uh, if the, uh, it's like two years down the road and the patient comes to see me with the wrong uh, power, I would do a, a laser vision correction to correct the, uh, the error. If the, if the error is too big and the patient comes after a few years, uh, an add-on lens here might be very helpful. So you have many options. One, spectacle. Uh, two, uh, uh, IOL exchange if it's early, which I think is the best. Uh, uh, three, laser vision correction if the uh, lens had been in the eye for many years. Uh, and there is fibrosis, and, um, or there is the opening of the posterior capsule, or the patient had the capsulotomy, uh, uh, then an add-on lens uh, uh, might be helpful if the error is big. If the error is small, then I would do uh, laser vision correct. Uh, are patients who have diabetes accepted candidates for multifocal lenses? Well, uh, well, if the patient, well, diabetes, I would say it, it's not a contraindication, but it depends on the stage of diabetes, if you have diabetic retinopathy. Of course, a patient who has macular dysfunction is not a good candidate for multifocal lenses. Uh, so diabetes per se is not a, a contraindication, but if the patient has diabetic retinopathy, then I would go for a monofocal lens. I have a question from Amjad Ibrahim. Uh, do you have any experience with the Alcon panoptics compared to the physiol EDOF lenses? I mean, which has better results? Well, uh, you, you see the big smile on my face. I'm not sure if you see it. Um, <laughs> well, yes, I have, I have some experience. Uh, I've put very few uh, panoptics, but I've seen a lot uh, of patients post panoptics. Uh, and I, I'll tell you, I'll put it in a, in a, in a, in a pragmatic way. I did not do many uh, Alcon pen optics, so I cannot tell you my own results with the pen optics. Now, for more than two years, I want to do uh, a pen optics, but every time I have a patient, you know, I remember the, I think of the excellent results I'm getting with the, um, with the pod F and pod FT, so I couldn't, change so far. But uh, the Alcon Pen Optics has definitely very good results. There are many published papers showing excellent results with Alcon Pen Optics. Um, the material is hydrophobic. I'm not very much uh, sure that the, the, the hydrophobic, unless it's glycine free, is the best uh, material that I want to use. Uh, the advantage of the pod F and pod FT uh, uh, is in the platform, the, the, the four points of fixation. The Alcon Pen Optics has an advantage uh, that if you have uh, uh, rupture in the posterior capsule, you can um, 
easily put it in the sulcus or uh, you do an optical capture. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, my results with the product and product are really excellent. I'm sure the Alcon plan optics gives very good results, but I don't have too much of experience uh, to share with you. Um, um, I had one patient who had, for different reasons, I did, I did a, a, a cod F on one eye, then he had the pen optics on the other eye, but this is only one patient. He, he was happier with the, uh, um, with the physiol lens, but again, this is one patient, so I cannot put conclusions based on this. Okay, okay uh, another one. question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, would multifocals interfere with the laser beam quality delivered to the diabetic retina? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think, I don't think I had, I, I don't think I had, uh, I had a um, couple of patients who had multifocal lenses and then they had uh, many years down the road, they had some uh, peripheral retinal uh, lattice degeneration that needed laser treatment. I, I did it with the, with the retinal surgeon and they, I, I don't think they had any problem. So I don't think uh, it's an issue uh, to have a multifocal lens and then to have a, a retinal a laser treatment uh, after. Okay. I will take one more uh, question. <clears throat> uh, you wouldn't recommend using physiol in any capsular uh, derangement, even if properly managed and seems to be stable? Well, I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, um, um, if you have, well, if you have a capsular derangement, you know, th this is very broad. If you have kind of um, zonular dialysis that you can put a capsular tension ring, then of course, yes. Uh, I put a capsular tension ring and put the physiol lens. Um, but if you have lost posterior capsule, you have big tear of the posterior capsule and you have a bad uh, rexus, then I wouldn't uh, uh, put a, a, um, a physiol lens in this case. Um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend. I know some surgeons have done sulcus fixated uh, with the uh, IOL with the physiol lens with good results, but I, I wouldn't recommend, especially in the, in, the, in the early phase of the learning curve. Uh, I would, the, you know, these are premium lenses. The surgery has to be very neat, very clean, Everything should be perfect in order to have very good results. Remember that these patients are looking for a, an exceptionally good result. So I would use these lenses only uh, if the, everything is good. But, but if you have capsular dialysis uh, uh, that can be fixed with the capsular tension ring, I would not hesitate to use it. So. I, think, uh, I think he meant uh, posterior capsular tear. Yeah, if you have a large capsular tear, uh, but, but you still have a good rexus where you can do optical capture, then yes. But if, uh, if, if it's, um, the anterior capsule is also lost, then I wouldn't uh, use uh, a double C loop lens. I would do either a sulcus fixated lens or I put the lens in the sulcus. So the physiol lens is not good to be uh, implanted in the sulcus. Right. Um, can we take one more question? Yes, of course. I think we can take the last one. How do you deal with patients who has uh, weak zonules? I think uh, this is yeah. easily answered. Yeah, if it's if it's um, if it's uh, it can be fixed with the capsular tension ring, then it, it's no problem. Uh, I wouldn't uh, hesitate to use the uh, multifocal lens, but because it has to do with the centration, you know, if if if. Uh, uh, and that's the same with the next question. Multifocal would be fair in scleral fixation. Well, they can be used, but uh, uh, if you can um, make sure that the centration of the lens is perfect, uh, because if you have this lens decentered, well, with the physiol, maybe that's important to mention. The central uh, 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 optical uh, uh, circle of the physiol before the start of the diffraction ring is 1.6, like 1.12 1 or something like this. So 1.16, uh, uh, the central part, this has to be 
in the uh, in the right position. If you have a decentration by more than half of this amount, if you have a decentration more than uh, 0.6 millimeter, uh, I wouldn't uh, use a multifocal lens. So with the scalar fixation, at, at least with the techniques I'm using, I cannot ensure such a perfect centration. But having uh, mentioned that, I must also say that I have seen patients with trifocal uh, physiol lenses uh, where the center of the lens is very much decentered relative to the optical axis or the visual axis. And I would expect these patients to do very bad, but actually when you measure clinically, you find that the patients are, are, are not bothered. So, um, so the, an the short answer is 0 0.6 millimeter of decentration is acceptable. Uh, however, more than this can be accepted, but this, is, this has to be proven with a formal uh, clinical trial. Perfect, perfect. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ala, and thank you everyone who attended this uh, interesting webinar. Thank you for sharing your experience about multifocal and quality of vision. Uh, we always learn from you and your experience, uh, Dr. Ala, and uh, hopefully we will see you soon. In person. In person, yes, <laughs> in person, absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, and have a good day.